Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poetry at the Dali. Thank you for being with us tonight. We appreciate your presence here. Uh, I'm Hank Hine, the museum director, and it's my privilege to uh, introduce this series, uh, which is curated by Helen Pruitt Wallace, the poet laureate of St. Petersburg. Thank you for recognizing that point, that pregnant pause there. Uh, we also have in attendance the poet laureate of the state of Florida, Peter Mankey. And as we know, almost everything of value we do is a collaborative effort. And uh, I think Peter would be the first to mention uh, his wife, Jeannie, in that collaboration. And as far as collaborations go, we have Peter Wallace here, uh, a terrific uh, collaborator in, in so many things in this city. So he does not write poetry though. He does correct spelling, however, which is so important and punctuation. So um, tonight we have a really wonderful lineup uh, for you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and I want to uh, mention that it's our tradition in this to ask Helen to begin the evening by reading one of her poems. Um, and this is uh, a tradition that we have been uh, absolutely rigid in maintaining, uh, insisting on. So uh, Helen, please come forward and, uh, and let us have a new poem. Thank you, and thank you to all of you all for coming out tonight to hear these really terrific poets. Um, I'm gonna read, it is a new poem. It's a poem I actually wrote for an event we just had at the Museum of Fine Arts um, called The Exquisite Corpse. Um, and some of you may have, may have been there and probably are familiar with that exercise, um, which of course started back with Dada and Dali and all the surrealists who used to play it frequently. Um, but at the Museum of Fine Arts, it involved visual art, and they actually also used music and dance. And this is the second year they invited poetry to be part of it. And poet Silver Cabello, who's here in the audience, was part of that, and also Peter Mikey, and I'm trying to see if there might be some others, but maybe some of you were there. Um, so we were chosen out of a hat to write a section of a poem, either the head, the torso, or the legs, and then uh, we were paired with two other poets, and then they had the unveiling where we all read each of our parts to see how it came out. And I was very lucky because I was paired with Sylvia and also um, Edith Chomer. But this is a whole new reworking of the, um, of the poem. Um, and it's called Unknowing End of Summer. Hummingbirds fled their feeders left hanging like vials of sweet blood, and maples shudder their letting go, both from and toward a buried seed. Each morning at my door, the same new box. I open it. A requiem spills out loss I cannot name, persistent as a phantom limb, heavy like the smell of rain, Someday, I'll take it as a gift, wash the feeders, rake the yard, missing what is and isn't gone, as if I knew them, that light, that weight, each bare branch. Thank you, thank you. Um, I met Terry years ago, um, and it's, it's really, Fun to have you here at the Dali. Um, and I did see her again recently at the AWP. I was at your panel, which was really terrific. Um, Terry Wittick is the author of six books of poems, most recently, The Rape Kit, winner of the 2017 Slope Editions Prize, judged by Don Lundy Martin. Her poetry often traces the breakages between words and images and has been included in American Poetry Review, Poetry, Slate, Poesia Visual, Versal, and many other journals and anthologies. 
uh, Terry directs the Stetson's undergraduate creative program. Um, and with Lopez teaches poetry in the expanded field at Stetson University's low residency MFA of the Americas. Uh, please welcome Terry Wittick. Thank you to the invitation for this beautiful place and with these wonderful writers. It's not often that when you Google, or when you Amazon your book and you look to see what comes up next to it, um, what it's just not often that what comes up are roofie detectors and alarm systems <laughs> and other things like that. <laughs> That's what happens, though, if your most recent book is called The Rape Kit. <laughs> you ready? Can you take us through what happened? Another elegiac door with its animal. Faulty the fire who was netted at his side in unlucky pelt swallowed the night next entered. Tape, condom, flashlight, rope, raped by a stranger as my children slept. Sob sobbing, pounding on door, barking in distance, TV turns on, metal clangs, mountain clears throat, door slams, groaning, chuckles, sighs, sniffles, thunder tree, plane tree, door closes, cicada, cicada, shivers, sing song voice, normal voice, Buzzer, he's sick, clicking, sighs, handcuffs, clicking, sighs, sighs, my husband chuckles, clicking, grunts, din distance, blue chair, breathing heavily, groans, buckle clinks, whispering, no money, zipper opens. Interlude, in which she tries to escape into a tree. Fold, fold. Now, tell us about the weapon. Gun barrel. Did you know him? Click, click, no. But certain things went down. All quiet at 2 a.m. It's over. Over. Uh-oh. Like anyone, he's lost his keys. Flashlight. Flashlight. Silver. Sliver. More years on. Q, what's a little late? A, always. Q, dressed for war, how do we dance? A, partition our garments. A, marry the dead. Drows making heat. Lay some sweet lines on me, baby. Yes, sir, we swallowed it. Hook, line, and sinker. History of the US. Dan Turner, father of rapist swimmer Brock, and the nymph Arethusa. You can see this in his face, the way wherever I moved my foot. He walks, his weakened voice, his lack of appetite, 
Brock always enjoyed certain types of food. He's a very good cook himself. I was always excited to buy him a big ribeye steak to grill or get his favorite snack for him. I had to make sure to hide some of my pretzels or chips and faster than I can now because I knew they wouldn't be around long after Brock walked in from swim practice. Now he barely consumes any food. He eats only to exist. These verdicts have broken and shattered him and our family in so many ways. His life tell, tell, will never be the one that he dreamed about and worked so hard to achieve. That is a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of action. I turn to water out of his 20 plus years of life. Q, who wrote the book of fleeing? A, a pouch of fragments. Q, what lies at a reasonable depth? A, the punctuating bone. In two minutes, the door. In five minutes, the blow. In two hours, the meeting. In two seconds, that breath. Birds swoop. Matter. Try it again, landlubber. The distance from here to a tree line by falling is what? The distance from me to you is four ropes and what? I can't think about that now, you say. I just can't go there. Western Civ. Quizlet's crime scene search methods and Arethusa's assailant, the river god Alpheus, and Donald Trump. Please wear clean, disposable overgarments, gloves, and masks. Never talk over. He traveled. I moved. Evidence. Clean all examination surfaces. Items should be packed, sealed sealed and labeled with her on her before removal from the crime scene through the seabed and reopened before examination. Different police should deal with different sides of the case and resurfaced victims and suspects should not be transported like a bitch in the same car. Let's try this again. How did you travel? Replace water with someone saying water. Replace someone saying water with someone sleeping. Replace someone sleeping with an empty glass. Card handed to officers requesting verbal repetition. I think you're sexy. I think you're sexy. I think you're sexy. Let's try this again. How did you travel? A land bird lies down with a gull. They aren't swimmers. The gull tucks the smaller bird under his wing. Next time a wave slides green over gold, the bird's been flipped. Now the gull's beak rummages tiny white guts. Forget about hunger. Forget about the next awful music. That's it. Let go. History of the US. Letter to the parole board and As who was raped and kidnapped from her in, by John Wendell Peltier, beg you not to release my assailant. As you know, Peltier was convicted as a signature criminal. The rape of is his signature as much as the actual fingerprints on my left when he vaulted back through without his gloves for a second, horrifying. The terror he induced 
a loaded gun aimed at my, the violation of my penetration and, and the threats he made to kill not only, but my three sleeping are his signature. That's who he is. No, should ever have to think he is out driving around at, with his rape kit. Please don't release him. Keep other safe from his on my. Before we go, can you say something raped? No, click, no. Sure. Thank you. Wow. I mean, powerful words and a powerful performance. Um, so thank you. Um, it's probably not easy to follow that. <laughs> Um, but we have Simeon Berry. Simeon won the 2013 National Poetry Series for his first collection of poems, Ampersand Revisited, published by Fence Books, and the 2014 National Poetry Series for his second book of poetry, Monograph, published by University of Georgia Press. He has been an associate editor for Plowshares and won a Massachusetts Cultural Council Individual Artist Grant. And he lives in Somerville, Massachusetts. Welcome, Mark Smith. Thank you, Helen, and thank you to the Dali for having me. Uh, it's an honor to read with Terry, and uh, I'm really going to have to bring the thunder after, after that. Uh, I thought I'd start by reading from my first book, Ampersand Revisited, uh, which is about uh, being raised by a father who was a healer and a practicing mystic. And uh, I should feel like it's, uh, I should let you know that it's not actually forbidden by statute for you to laugh during the reading of poetry. So if you're sensing dark humor, it's, it's probably there. Uh, also, there are no section titles um, or poem titles in either of these two books. So you're also free from, the, from that. These are latter days. You regard the writ of frost on the window pane as a blueprint for something yet to come, something severe and intricate. Every few weeks, the drowned pilot from the bay walks up the stairs dripping wet, but you go back to your bed over the furnace before he reaches the top. It's important to be practical about these things. See the apparition, then go back to sleep. Your sheets are stark parchment lit by a burning telegram that gives off the incense of human hair. It's still 1985, and your mother is downstairs having sex with Hector and his cut-rate cocaine. When you tell this to your father, you add, forsooth? Not everything about the medieval mind is witty, but you seem to think it makes you approachable. It does not. In your father's filing cabinet, a short letter claims your IQ is exclamation point percentage, exclamation point, and you wish you never found it. It does not make the fifth grade any easier, and even though it seems like the last detail, you know that there are more to come. Across the room, your younger brother relaxes into the hoarse declaratives of his relentless hardcore records. The lead singers are averse to consonants and seem to feel that everything, mind, body, spirit, the world, has failed them. He lowers his fall of blonde hair, taking his face away elaborately. You love him because he suffers without excuse, unlike your older brother, who must ostentatiously starve himself with organic vegetables. Duncan seems mauled by his spirit animals and just barely manages to be irritably serene. He looks up from his radishes and kale and says, you must leave the house. He is going to channel the bear now, and it is very loud. 
this seems neither new age nor polite when you have no choice. The low afternoon light solders the sliding glass door into a slab of gold circuitry, and you step out cautiously into the phasic shapes of the falling snow. There are those who hate you because you like to live in explanation, that ideal sinking city, its placid canals lined with beautiful data. Consequently, you try to be so unruffled that people either find you boring or exotic. This has mixed results. Your biology teacher alludes to aliens, pyramids, and auras, but seems to have a sense of humor. So when he hands you a sharp glyph of crystals, you blurt out, my father used to be a clairvoyant and healer. That's what he did in Europe. You look up, oh, was that out loud? It was. You can see it on your teacher's face as he thinks hard, trying to work around the black orchid, growing more specific and lovely in his occipital lobe. You find the Bronze Age comforting, and you dream about water polo players scowling outside their lockers as they chip obsidian blades one molecule wide. While your mother is out buying a universe of avocado, you discover the 38 bandaged into a beige atom in her pantyhose. Just perfect, you think, for brandishing at the butcher. A full pound, damn it, and bloody. The comedy makes you even sadder. She says she's holding it for someone else. You immediately tell your father about it when he picks you up for his weekend. It might be meant for him. He laughs. Danger is relative. Sometimes after a reading or a healing, I'd come to and be driving through a meadow at 60 miles an hour. Spend too much time outside the body and you become like a paragraph, transitory fictional. Other parents at the cult meeting talk about ritual hunger, about Sanskrit scribbled like the names of heavy metal bands across textbooks. Then your father clears his throat. I myself got out in 78. I was sent to teach healing in Europe while my kids got scurvy from lack of fruit on the commune. I could see that my guru wasn't going to be able to hold it together. You can't breathe. You, sp you spread your hands flat on the cheap fold-out table. True, the community came to grief for very good reasons. But that doesn't disprove the clairvoyance and the angel that appeared to him in the empty shower stall and told him what was needed to save your life. You've never been able to understand why what moves you most is not the data itself, but his warnings about the technology. Every mystery school, going back to Egypt and Atlantis, knows that everything is possible, but not necessarily a good idea. Even the I Ching was a collection of spells before the Confucians purged it. Some phenomena are pretty goddamned serious, and you can't always shut the door on them if you throw it open to the night. Uh, I'm reading some poems from my uh, second book, Fingerling Lakes in Progress, uh, currently 150 pages, needing to be 80 pages through various chainsaw maneuvers that I will bust out. Uh, I started this series a few years ago on Halloween for my friend Julie Story, uh, who's from Indiana, and it's a sort of teenage girl's uh, coming of age story in a Midwestern Gothic uh, format, and there's some Lovecraft that I've snuck in there as well. Station identification. I come out here when the wheat gets restless and barbed. Mom's close to the corpse light on channel nine where some old guy said the spirit turned his hair white. Now he's going to live to be 950 like Noah. Phosphorescence comes out of the walls, makes the stitched samplers horrible and plush. Tonight, Jay gave me some pail from a mason jar said it would screw up my courage. Tastes like it's made from potatoes buried over graves from those eyes. 
Miss Relieve says, it's the vitreous. Dad lost his arm in the thuros when the thresher went sideways. He barely stopped the rest of him from falling into the dirt. Jay wants it. Stell says it smells like the sea, like an accident under the harvest moon. I'm just a girl with groundwater in her ratted hair, head cocked, listening to something grievous come out of the sky. Genre. Miss Raylene says there's only two plots. A stranger comes to town, a man goes on a journey. At midnight, under mom's quilt pattern, calico spat, I know there's a third. Something to do with bridles hanging sour and wet in empty closets, a blonde palace of rotted hay. Then I'm dreaming again. Mom says the jar at the county fair interfered with her marital duties. Dad leans back inside his eyes, watches news that depends on animal parts. I get ridiculous. Go out to the chevette squatting on cinders, crawl behind the blistered wheel, turn up Arcturus on the radio like a bad idea, and think on Stell, her brother in the back of the twistered bus, her copper eyes shallow as piss on a plate, her small wrists pulled together tight and red during volleyball. Know that if I got her alone in the dark, we'd both see by then. In geometry, Miss Raylene says, it's given. Alternative, mom and I really aren't at the health food store because dad thinks they snort saffron and feel bad for the extra electrical life in tomatoes. But mom buys me mandrake bars that fork in my mouth into syrup and earth. And I like to watch her flirt with the gentle burnout whose outfit is the biker beige suede vest and flaxen harem pants. So I am mute. mute. Mom says she talks to him because the Lord liked losers. But he's got a bassist's hands and that loose jointed look of having slept around Renaissance fairs. When she gets that shy smile, I walk back between the painfully unfinished wood shelves, the, the bins of dusty beans and grains lovingly closed like hope chests, and remember Miss Raylene telling us spices camouflaged rotting meat and embalmed bodies. At the back, the, the, the community board is a haphazard collage of crystals taped up in overlapping centerfolds like alien genitalia. Folks offering the dead like runway models to tell you how to live and why the biotin isn't activated in your blood, how we're still suffering from an ancient Egyptian plague of wheat. I hear mom asking the clerk if he can say, they were sore afraid and elvish to her. As my eye glosses over the one-shot seminars, the vacuum-sealed promises to find someone who looks a lot like my friend advertising laying on of hands in the lineage of Esther, Salome, and Joan of Arc. Vespers. There is or isn't weed, and someone might have it or X. So that's why we're in the parking lot of chicken and waffles. <laughs> Stell's mother passed out from too much excitement at book club, <laughs> where everyone no doubt lied about having read all of Dr. Shivago. Stell says it's synchronized drinking with the theme, and Dr. Z's is, this liquor has no taste. So we're rolling in her mother's pink abomination of a Cadillac lacquered with the pinpoint odor of hairspray laid over cinnamon nips. Jay is negotiating badly for a bag with the exchange student who claims to have bought leaf from Ireland. Stell is skeptical. Your boyfriend's probably being talked into buying a peat bog as we speak. He looks over at me. Hun, what you think as sweetness is weakness and helplessness and you know he won't forgive you when you figure it out. I sigh and watch their black hoodies lean very close together like they're inhaling the same sad yellow smoke of the parking lot's sodium light. 
And I remember those Gregorian chants mom used to play when she was upset with dad. They made me think men had a secret language that rhymed and longed and never ended, and I was mad they kept it from us. Hands. Billy's trailer feels like hobbits built a spaceship. Everything is rounded brown and upholstered in smoke, and I'm not very good at gin. He says his squad used to play it religiously because we worshiped chance, and it seemed appropriate when everything was an IED, shopping cart, dead dog, soda can, nothing so stupid it couldn't kill you when you flipped it over. And that dizziness you'd get from looking up at those strange stars. Damn zealots had those incantations etched on their RPGs. We called it whistling down the wind. Sometimes I wake up with it in my ears. He sips his sickly beer and puts it back unsteadily as I reach across the speckled table to him. That's horrible, he shrugs. Who's to say? We had our own geeks working in posthumous assets, and I don't even want to tell you what the turnover there was like. A lot of guys changed their wishes to cremation afterwards. I look down at the bloody circuitry of my forgotten hearts and diamonds hand. What did you do when you came back? He laughs. Well, I didn't want to drink myself to death in the garage, so I bought a trailer. Uh, and I'm going to close by reading from uh, my second book, uh, Monograph, uh, which is just a bunch of prose blocks. So there are no titles in this either. Uh, I find it funny for someone who obsesses over line breaks uh, for as much as I do that I've written two books that contain the minimum amount of line breaks in them to sustain human life. Thought back to that first October after moving to the city both of us temping, broke and in debt, barely able to afford the rent on a basement efficiency next to the elevator. Our sole extravagance, a bonsai tree stiffening on, stiffening on the window. Fairly certain we were doomed as a couple, repeating this to myself every night as I walked home in darkness through the close suburban streets, the smell of the sea infiltrating the fog, utterly ecstatic with rage. When my grandfather tried to tell my dad obliquely that my mother was mentally ill, he had to take him out on the water in a rowboat to do it. There they were safe, or at least equally in danger. He, like other New England fishermen, could not swim. These are the people I come from. R says C has been dredging up a bunch of sexual trauma. This is the second girl he's dated who was raped in the past. Last night, he came home stoned, and C was enraged. And when he turned his back on her, she punched him. He just said, I can't believe you did that, then walked away. She rushed after him, shouting, wait, don't you want to know why I hit you? When my dad was traveling and teaching healing in Europe, he woke in his hotel one morning and discovered his passport was missing. The room was full of spirit guides arguing about where he should go next. As soon as he yelled at them, they vanished, and the passport instantly appeared on the table in front of him. These kinds of ambiguous difficulties are not, as they say, in the literature, but they're what make this real for me. If I took one thing from my father's universe, it's that everyone has an agenda, even when they don't have a body. N told me she trained herself to masturbate with highlighters. First one, then two, then three. It was her reward for homework. I cannot imagine she thought that I would be able to resist lingering over this metaphor. How French to make scholarship seem sexy. How American to make the emphasis literal. Compared notes with D. He has sex about three times a month. Well, I only have it twice a month. He was cheerful. Well, it sounds like your marriage is in a lot worse shape than mine. He is thinking of bugging his wife's computer because he suspects she is cheating. 
She calls him drunk at 3 a.m. to ask him to come and pick her up from his friend's house. He wishes, with a great deal of fervency, that he could confirm his suspicion that she was sexually abused as a child. It's all very East German. The night Virginia Woolf finally slept over, her lover, Vita Sackville West, memorialized the event in her diary by simply writing three exclamation points. I, myself, would want four. <laughs> Which proves that the first thing one wants to do with a perfect metaphor is to wreck it. The first time I come home with N, her father and sister pick us up at the airport at night in a blizzard. They have already opened a case of beer, and they drink steadily during the harrowing drive back through the mountains. I say nothing. I just think to myself, OK, so that's how it is. Later, I realize that is not how it usually is. They were making a point. Return for the second half of Christmas with N's family. Over here, her father gloating to a friend on the phone about his lack of reaction when opening his presents. You should have seen their little face faces. So crestfallen. N says he's difficult to shop for. I stare into my pallid eggnog as the cup flexes in my hand. Went out last night with M in a lavender tie and a purple shirt. Felt like a sexual racketeer. Raymond Chandler would have approved. M says he is fighting every night with R, who is triumphantly agoraphobic. They both scream and cry and threaten to flee the apartment. Then they have sex. At first, I was frightened, then jealous, then frightened again. <laughs> N confesses to me that she watched G.I. Joe as a kid and that she wanted to be Scarlet. I myself wanted to be the mute, scarred snake eyes. I am dumbfounded. Even as a 10-year-old, I found the show unbelievably hokey. No one ever got killed, and their M16s fired dotted lines of lasers, despite the fact that they were clearly wearing belts of ammunition. At first, I marvel over the irony. I'm a pacifist who's never been in a fight. She's a reformed, radical lesbian. Yet we like the same campy military cartoon. Then I get sad. This is what you fall in love. Dreamed that a lot of people had been killed and buried in the sand. Realized that this was Bloody Cove of my childhood, where a bunch of Native Americans were massacred, and where I had daily lessons on the tennis courts every summer. According to my grandfather, this was what a well-bred young man did, along with sailing and ignoring the 20th century. Not terribly surprising that I tend to think of masculinity itself as a type of minor catastrophe. In the dream, my mission was to find and lock the last door to New England in Maine so that we would be safe, discounting the hordes of weird and bony moose about. I imagine this Yankee relationship with the land, formal, mythic, futile, was what drove my grandfather to wear a tie when he pulled up lobster traps in his rowboat. <laughs> my mother tries to convince me not to leave N by enlisting the Jehovah's Witnesses with whom she has been flirting. They understand about mysteries, she says, about what draws people together. Well, what I understand, I say, is that they have incorrectly predicted the end of the world 16 times. <laughs> she gets angry. So you're going to be just like your father, who didn't think we should be a family? Is that what you want? I barely refrain from pointing out that even though he was the one who filed, she chose to get divorced. He wasn't going to leave her. That is, until he discovered that the only thing that was more exciting for her than secretly having sex with a drug dealer who didn't speak any English was refusing to stop when she was caught. It couldn't just be a mistake. It had to be a story. I'm sad, so I go alone to the candlelight mass at Christmas. My favorite part is the end, when the sexton brings down the lights, and I'm alone with the feeling of breathing in the dark with hundreds of people. I think of the secret gospel of Mark, 
the one with the verses where Lazarus falls in love with Jesus after being raised. He spends the night alone with him, dressed only in a linen cloth, so that Jesus can teach him the mystery of God's domain. I reach out for N's absent hand in the pitch black. My dad discloses that he actually briefly succeeded in dragging my mother to couples counseling. After the time was up, the therapist announced with peculiar intensity, the men's bathroom is just down the hall to the right. As my dad was returning, the therapist slipped out and intercepted him in the corridor. I shouldn't be doing this, he said. It's not even professional. But that woman in there, she just wants a house and money and she wants you to take care of everything. He paused meaningfully. They looked at one another. Generally, men bore me, but I have to admire this moment. We may not be able to approximate an honest emotion, but goddamned if we can't float an implication. <laughs> N reveals in couples therapy that she went off birth control three months ago, as if she had told me that she was no longer taking her pills. She says it with such a lack of emphasis that it takes me a moment. Then the room becomes bright and horribly detailed. After swimming, E and I drive through the calm oaks on either side of the, of the back road. We stop at a gourmet grocery store set randomly beside a field, buy pomegranates and dark chocolate, and sit down at the edge of the parking lot watch the effortless light on the tall grass, the sun going down. E talks about the Masons, theoretical particles, her new, her new love, what they do and don't have to do with one another. I say nothing, which makes me suspect that I'm happy. N would never let me kiss or lick the small seraph on the side of her breast where they removed the mass. It was neither benign nor malignant, simply anomalous. I liked it because it made me think of the Japanese art kintsugi. When a work of ceramic broke, they would inlay the cracks with gold and find it more beautiful afterwards because it existed in time now and had a history. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Simeon. Thank you. Um, we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, but before we do, I just want to do a shout out to AARP. Thank you for supporting us and also for the uh, city of St. Petersburg who's supporting us as, as well. And to let you know that next, um, next month, we have the State Poet Laureate, Peter Meinke, will be reading. He has a new book out, or is, is, it hasn't actually been published yet, right? It's hot off the press? Just out, okay, so um, we'll get to hear Peter read from his new book. Um, and also a poet from Miami, Holly Iglesias. Um, some of you may be familiar with her work. Um, she writes some wonderful prose poems and all kinds of stuff, so she'll be visiting from Miami. So the two of them will be um, on December 13th. Um, so let's take some questions to, for both Terry um, and Simeon. Um, and then afterwards, they'll both be selling books in the back as usual. Start? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask Terry an unfair question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so your words were so compelling. Uh, is there anything you can say about how you came to write this? Um, it's not an unfair question. Um, I had an actual writing prompt, um, which was that the man who raped me was about to be released from jail. And I was tasked with writing a letter to the parole board. And you know, as a writer, it was like, you know, what was I? I had to think a lot about the words I used and what actually I, I thought. And that really was an interesting thing to do because I realized how crazy a lot of the languages surrounding um, all different kinds of things. It's not just sexual assault. But for one thing, for example, the rape kit is what is taken 
from the victim, or once again, I hate, I'm not going to use, is taken from the, the raped. I dislike the word victim. Survivor. I don't like the word survivor. I think that victim is one down, survivor is one up. They're both ways of saying it's not me. I think you should, I, my preference is the raped, the unraped, the pre-raped, you know what I mean? I mean, call it by the act rather than trying to other the person to whom the action was performed. I also will not say trigger warning at my readings because it's to me trigger is a violent word. So you see, I have all this problem with language because every word seems so double. But the rape kit, of course, is what is taken from the raped, but it's also what the perp had in his car, the tape, condom, flashlight, rope, that made him identifiable to the police. So do you understand what a double mirrored thing this was? Which of course as a writer, you know, is an opportunity, right? These are not things we look away from, you know, they're opportunities. So, um, is Simeon so good at narrative, though? I kept thinking the whole time, I was like, man, he, this man can tell a story. He can tell like a thousand stories. I'm very associative. So for me to be narrative as I am like I was tonight, I have to be associative and performative so you will follow the logic. If I could do what you would do, I would be very grateful. <laughs> I would be very grateful. And I'm sure the parole board would be super happy. <laughs> I'll have to reach out to me. <laughs> Please do. I have a question on this. I have a follow-up for that. Um, so, Terry, when you, did, did you envision the performance aspect of the poem from the get-go, or is that something that evolved after a lot of the poem was already written? Um, I didn't think about it particularly. I was trying to put different pieces of language together, and a lot of the book came together by putting together unlikely couples. And so I do that in the language. It's the nymph Arethusa and Donald Trump. It's Brock Turner and the nymph Arethusa. It's um, Melville and, you know, it's Michael Jackson and, you know, uh, Rawlinson. So the idea is that unlike things lie down together in an assault, they're also unlike things lie down together in a metaphor. It's just what we do as poets. So for me, the performance thing, there was so much of it that isn't, there are not a lot of words in here. There's a lot of drawings. There's a lot of different kinds of things. So I realized I had to do it in a different way. And I was going to show images because there's a lot of images in the book. But then I realized there was something kind of suspect about that. It was a refusal to take it, to put it in my body. So this book, I think I have to put in my body. You know, the next one when I'm wandering around the museum or whatever, nobody's going to care <laughs> yeah. or read it. But, but yeah, I, just, I felt it was important to sort of put it in my body. Interesting. Good questions. Yes, Peter. Well, I could add that uh, Simeon's voice is very, very original. And I'm yeah. interested in the writers that Simeon liked or who he thought might have influenced him or Sure. Um, well, Mary Oliver and Yusef Komanyaka and Kenneth Patchen taught me how to write an image. Um, it, Larry Levis has been one of my stars. He taught me how to have like a long associative um, argument from Ampersand Revisited. Some of my self-conscious work I got from uh, Lynn Emanuel and especially her book Interior, not in, uh, then suddenly, which is one of the most uh, enjoyable and uh, subversive books of poetry I've ever read. She's got this long takedown of um, Walt Whitman called Walt, I Salute You. It's <laughs> fantastic. Um, also, there's a little Donald Hall and Philip Levine hiding yeah. in there, <laughs> in voices. Um, Andrea Style. Larry Levis taught me how to move in time and space. That was, 
that was incredibly valuable. Uh, and a large part of my diction and some of that formal humor came from my father, along with 70% of the rest of my intellect. Yeah, <laughs> and, and your father is, is great, by the way. Everybody ought to meet, meet your dad. He's here but this evening. He's here this evening. <laughs> But I think your poems are visually interesting too, right? So can you talk about that? A little Certainly. Bit? Well, I am. I, I wanted actually to be a painter and to have visual talent, uh, and then I took a, a pen and ink course in, in college and discovered that I was the least talented person there. <laughs> um, but I've always thought that when I started writing, what was the use of writing poems if you couldn't transform the world, if you couldn't make it strange, if you couldn't make it as much of an alternate reality as a cyberpunk novel? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you have these images. Why should they be these little tepid, gauzy things? I, I want them 50 feet tall and flashing neon and, and, and coming for you on you know, silent casters. Um, so I, this gets me into trouble sometimes when I stack images upon images. And, um, but I want poems that are uh, beautiful but visually deranging. And I think this is because I was raised in a, in a mystical worldview um, where everything is symbol. Everything is just the idea of the thing and a container for energy. And so I have not engaged in a mystical career, but I like to think that some of those alchemical transformations that I make to reality in the poems are my kind of like low rent cottage industry of that. <laughs> I did. I'm actually from Connecticut. Um, I live in, in Boston now, but I, I went to New College in Sarasota and then Eckerd College in St. Pete. What years were you, were you at Eckerd? Uh, New College was 91 through 94, and Eckerd was 95 through 98. Mm -hmm. okay. So I know both Sterling Watson, who teaches fiction, at, used to teach fiction at Eckerd College, and um, Scott Ward both claim you. <laughs> oh, yes. No, no. <laughs> The, the three people that I owe my literary t career to are my father, Scott Ward, and Sterling Watson. Those are the voices that They'll I hear, hear in my that. head when I'm debating something. Absolutely. Good. And, and, and Sterling, I'm especially grateful to because I actually took more fiction undergrad workshops than poetry workshops. Because yeah. I think all poets should cross-train. And fiction teaches you um, some wonderful tools you can use in your poetry, such as the ability to handle characterization and to move, to, to move in time and space and to, to be able to handle scenes and it makes you less precious about your lines and it just makes you just a little bit less narcissistic, um, which is a constant battle. Uh, Are you writing fiction? Uh, I'm not writing fiction, but I am working on a memoir about comic books and literary subculture, um, which attempts to figure out why I have to talk to comic books about literary people, even when reaction is really bad. In fact, <laughs> especially when it's really bad. And why um, I go back to an art form, namely comics, but also kind of poetry, that disappoints me so often, but which I need more than anything else. Those are, poetry and comics are the, the two types of reading material that I've read the most in my life. And I'm a spreadsheet geek, so I have numbers to that effect. <laughs> um, and it's, a, it's also a disguised defense of genre, because I feel that there's, there's fabulous stuff out there in the comics universe, much as in the pulp universe of sci-fi and fantasy, which high culture kind of dismisses, um, or sort of stoops to address in a kind of like, look, I found, I found this pop culture roadkill, and I will manipulate it and stuff it, and it'll be an object of curiosity rather than serious scholarship. And I would like it to be an object of serious scholarship and acknowledge its limitations. And I would like poetry to acknowledge its limitations as well, so that it can become better and less insular. Also, I'd like a pony. <laughs> In what order? I'll take the pony first, because then I can escape from the critics if they turn on me. Good. Good. Back here. Yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. In the far back? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Simeon, oh. this is kind of a difficult question for me to articulate, but when did you realize it was okay for you to become a poet and what 
kind of support did you have in furthering that career? Um, I realized poetry was a thing I could do uh, January of uh, Washington's birthday, 1991. <laughs> um, my, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was probably about 7.45 in the evening. Uh, and the seconds were? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm against seconds. I think oh, we should yeah. just abolish them. They're, they're, a, they're a pointless metric. Um, my, uh, my little sister's au pair uh, wrote poems, and they were very simple. They were just her emotions on a page. Um, she wasn't an, an intellectual. Uh, she was from Lowell, Massachusetts. She had very big hair and the accent, uh, but she knew two things. She knew what not to say on the, on the page, and she knew when to stop. And it... it it exploded my cranium. I thought that poetry had to be rhymed and in meter and it had to be an argument. That, like, it was essentially a rhetorical math problem that you had to solve because that's how it was taught to me in school. And, I, and her poems just showed me that no, it could be anything you want as long as it's urgent and not lazy. And then I wrote like 60 poems in a month and I just kept on writing. Um, and it would be another five years before I was good at all and before I realized that maybe I had some kind of responsibility to these poems and I should put them out in the world and that was valuable. Um, and then uh, I transferred to Eckerd and Scott and Sterling said, actually, yes, poets do need to be involved in the larger world and it will make you a better writer. And it was true. Um, when I'm sending poems out for publication, I'm 10% more of a better editor because you, you catch those last little indulgences and in your inside jokes that are, that, are, that are in there when you're thinking of a heartless stranger at the end of a long day and an in, unpaid internship who's reading your poem and is not going to be amused by how clever you are. And it helps me to see that. Um, and so it was sort of a long process before I realized that this just wasn't a thing that I, I did in secret um, in my basement. like growing pot in my closet, <laughs> which I didn't do, <laughs> which, but which felt the same. We had another question in the far back. Was it Emily? Yeah. Yes. I have this question for Carrie. Yes. Um, so I haven't seen the rape kit locations of it, but what I found myself wondering as you were reading is, what's at this page look like? Because Yeah, you know, one of the things about white space and on the page is that it isn't silent at all. And so when I, I for example, in the, um, I had to decide how to write, how to read that letter to the parole board because those are, are empty spaces on the page where in performance I make a noise. And one of the reasons I did that, Anne-Marie, was because I didn't want the women, or the children, I didn't want them to be in the poem. I wanted them to have escaped, right? And so I took out everything that was a she. I took out the kids. I actually took out the word night. I thought, why should the night have to be, you know, <laughs> in there for this? Um, so on, on the, the experience on the page is really different. I mean, you don't have a choice but to listen when I perform it. But I think when you see it on the page, you understand that what's missing is actually a pres it's a presence that's chosen. But of course, it also recalls the open window through which the rapist climbed again for the second horrifying time. So yeah, I'm super precise about this. And it's funny because as Simeon was kind of suggesting our styles are made up by what we can't do a lot of times. I can do none of this. I have no technical skill. I've got no, so I'm always had these teams of people that are trying to help me, you know, like, um, and the, the one, my former student, Luciana uh, Ramos, well, actually I have two former students here tonight. Um, three, Anne-Marie and um, Jared, and who else is here? Somebody else I know? Yeah, yeah, well, anyway. Um, 
that, 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 that somehow I always have these wonderful students who know how to do sort of digital art things. And it was important to me, for example, there's a set of fingerprints um, in the book. And I, I didn't want to know whose fingerprints they were. I just didn't want to know. And actually, in, in the case in which John Wendell Peltier, which was um, sent, for which he was sent to prison, the signature rape that my case was part of, he was convicted on the evidence of, of fingerprints when he came back through the window the second time. But for me, it was important that they not be his fingerprints, they not be my fingerprints, but that we don't know whose fingerprints they are. It is, after all, a stranger rape. So there, yeah, I thought a lot, there, but you know, you just have to figure out how to do stuff you don't know how to do, as Simeon was suggesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the performance is such a powerful part of, of that, the way you. Well, thanks, I mean, you know. The, the thing is that hopefully, I mean, there's this really uncomfortable thing about the whole thing. What do you want to know about? Do you want to know about the poetry or do you want to know about the rape? And I'm not going to let you decide that in the performance. I'm just going to, because it's just, what Laura Mullen suggests on the back of the book that poetry itself may be a kind of an, a rape kit. In other words, it's evidence and it requires examination. And I thought that was a really brilliant thing to say. You know, that every act we make, if, you know, even an incision of a mark, right, has its not only its doubleness, but it needs to be queried. If you're a police person, um, a rapist in Tennessee in the mid 80s, this was called a crime against person, which I thought was such a wonderful, you know, title. So, yeah. So what do you work on next? Oh, Have well. finished that? Yeah, yeah, nobody, yeah. Like I said, no one will care. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm in the middle of it. I'm 75 pages in. It's like that wonderful thing you were saying about your memoir. You just, you know, start to do this thing you don't know how to do. I ended up spending literally a week in the Louvre, like nine hour days. And so my new book is called Something is Missing in This Museum. Yeah, so prob so far, I have no idea, but I'm just, every day, <laughs> every day I open the book to a different painting and then something happens. And uh, I'm not writing about the paintings exactly, so I don't know, I'll, you, you will, next time we encounter, <laughs> I'll try them out on you. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Thank you for asking. Um, your new book is about walking around in a museum. I remember your, one of your first books, Fool in Prose, was a classic. Do you yeah. see yourself returning to familiar ground? Mm -mm. No. I think the thing was, it, and I, everybody, I, I'm so grateful to Jared for asking me this question because people that love fools and crows, you know, I'm standing there, I'm looking at these paintings or these Catholic paintings. You know, I'm from this Catholic family. It's sort of this way to figure out kind of what happened, and I'm looking at the painting. But the thing is, I wanted to be in the painting. And so my second book, Carnal World, I talk about models and people who were in paintings, and by that time, you know, I'd stay after a painter, and you know, you know. So, but I didn't feel like I was really in the painting. You know what I mean? There was something that was missing. And it turned out that what I needed to do was to become a visual poet. You know, because I can't, I'm, with, I'm like you, I wanted, I, I flunked too. I flunked all that, plus I flunked <laughs> fiction. So, you know, you're, you're, you're way more talented than I am. Oh, no, no, all my, all my stories failed. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I left a drunk on the couch, and the whole class got, got a failing grade because it, I forgot to move her to the next room in the fiction scene. Yeah, I was terrible. <laughs> Someone in my, in, in my, my, uh, my fiction workshop said, it, it sounded like I would rather describe a dead horse than write a sentence that wasn't perfect. Oh, but I think that's a backhanded compliment. They're saying your sentences are I took are it as perfect. a compliment. They you should. Did not intended. As well. Oh, I see. I see. I see. So no, I think what happens in the new in the new poems is that you get the feeling of somebody who who is kind of in the painting, and the paintings are kind of not paintings. They're kind of in the in the scene in the city. I mean, it's really like drops or 
motions on the page. But they're, they're all words. It's, it's much wordier. Um, I mean, we'll see. Who knows? I'm, I'm totally enjoying writing them, though. Um, the other thing, if you don't mind if I say that I totally enjoyed writing this, people all say, oh, is it therapeutic? I'm like, I don't know. Um, oh, was it hard? No, it was easy. It was a breeze. It was like the easiest book I ever wrote. I was so filled with stuff about it. You know what I mean? Just clapped together every day. Another poem clapped together in my hands. And you know how we are. And we're always sequestered because of hurricanes. And I was, you know, holed up in some hotel room and some, you know, just putting these texts together. And I was really happy. I was happy as a clam. <laughs> so uh, it's not, so you remember that the act of writing is not the same thing as the subject matter. That's all I'm saying. Yes, please. When did you know you were allowed to come forward? This is Terry's. This is my daughter, <laughs> Eli Winnick. <Whittick. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> my children, my students. This is so great. Your dad. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, so I never, you know, this is part of the Mark Strand point about the style is the matter of your limitations. Um, I, there's not a lot, of, this sounds terrible. I really love teaching and I, I hopefully I was a decent mother. Um, and, and I was a really good breastfeeder. I mean, you know, I like, I like three things I'm super good at and the rest of it, not good. Like, ask me how to get out of the hotel, get back to the hotel, which is literally three minutes away, and I'm not going to be able to tell you. <laughs> so it was clear to me that poetry was more, you know, of course, we were all total readers and, and stuff. So, you know, that. But I did win a contest in fourth grade. And my poem, yes. And my little poem was published in the, in the newspaper, in the local newspaper, the Sandusky Register. It's really a pious little piece of crap. Um, but I looked at that little thing alive on this, in the middle of this paper, and I thought, wow, look at this little thing, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, fourth grade. <laughs> but, I, you know, but when people ask you, I didn't say I was a poet. I mean, do you say you're poets? When did you start to call yourself a poet? Yeah. Hmm. After you published your first book, or before that? Well, I realized it was really bad to say I was an English teacher. <laughs> because no then they, questions. Because, yeah, no, because people say, oh, I was so terrible at that. You know, and so I, because I had said I was a teacher for years, and then I started to say I was a writer, and they go, oh, what did you write? You know, like some hope that it was going to be something anybody would have encountered. So I was kept disappointing people. <laughs> So the thing I think about saying I'm a poet, I just decided to start saying it on my tax returns. I started putting it down in different places to see if I could actually do it and what would happen. Nobody cared. And as a matter of fact, it's great. Nobody asks you about it at all. They just go, ooh, Imagine that. ooh. So they're, they're vaguely impressed, but no one wants to talk to you about it. Aces. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. There'll be books out front. Yeah. Thank you so much.